God bless you all. And thank you so much for, um, again, just receiving us with all the love that you do. I want to thank you for your kindness to Johnny today. Uh, Johnny, for, so, for those of you who don't know, Johnny is autistic. And uh, so we got in the car. He said, did I do okay? I go, yes, yes, you did. Awesome. And, and uh, you, uh, many of you just encouraged him so much. And uh, so I, I thank you for that. He loves coming here. How many of you remember um, the WWJD little movement, the What Would Jesus Do movement? Began to see that everywhere, bracelets and uh, necklaces and uh, even billboards. Well, in our area, a car dealer grabbed a hold of that and, and put up a billboard saying, well, what would Jesus drive? <laughs> and so people were so offended. Oh, sacrilege. And then they began to talk about like, Cadillac, uh, a BMW, a Lexus, a Mercedes. And I, we were talking with a group of friends, and I said, no. You know what Jesus drives? He drives a Yugo. Amen. They said, a, a Yugo? Yeah. You go. And so I, I put together this little message for my church years and years ago, like I said, in the 90s. And I just said that you and I are Jesus taxis. He tells us where he wants to go. And we're supposed to go. How would you feel about a taxi driver not taking you where you want to go? but him going where he wants to go doesn't work. Well, for those of you who are younger, um, we are now Jesus Ubers, not Goobers, Ubers. Or we lift Jesus, amen? But we're simply vessels that contain a treasure. And we are to go where he sends us and do what he is calling us to do. This theme of let God arise is so powerful. And like I said, I'm going to go home and preach all your messages. But I was very touched by, by some of the things that I learned in this place this week. The Lord really moved here. And I pray that tonight um, you'll receive something from this word that I, that I want to bring. The, I, had this, I had this little, uh, it wasn't a vision or anything, but I, I thought I, I would stand up here and say, you know, we need three volunteers. And I was going to call Mike Frazier and I was going to call Pastor Charlie and say, you know, we need someone to go and, uh, and we need the tallest person in the room to go on this mission. It's a very dangerous mission. Someone has to go, and I'm, you know, I'm safe because <laughs> next to Mike Frazier and next to Charlie. And, and then I said, we got it. So someone has to do this for the Lord. And I was going to have them kneel. And then when the, both of them kneel, guess who's the tallest? Guess who's going? And it's like that. It's like that in the kingdom of God. Uh, you can't be focused on your limitations. Amen. You have to just hear what he says and go do it. Amen. Because he's called each and every one of us. But that posture of kneeling is, is one of worship. And I want to talk a little bit, little bit about worship because I believe that is the quickest way to get God to arise. Amen. Uh, is to exalt him. To exalt him means to lift him up. I've talked several times this week about building him the throne. Every time you and I gather together through our praise and our worship, we build him a throne, and then he comes and he takes his place. And the river begins to flow from that throne. And it flows on to those who have built the throne. And that's where we run to the throne of grace. Amen? Amen. In the book of Judges, uh, chapter 13... 
we have the story of um, Samson. And uh, the Lord is looking for an occasion to move against the Philistines. And uh, so Samson is about to be born to a barren woman, if you remember. And the angel of the Lord appears to Manoah's wife. Now, it doesn't mention her by name, so we're going to call her Mrs. Manoah. And he appears to her and, and tells her that she's going to uh, have a son and that he's going to be a Nazarite from birth. He's going to be sanctified. He is not to do certain things. I'm going to read this to you. This is Judges 13, 15. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please let us detain you, and we will prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Though you detain me, I will not eat your food. But if you offer a burnt offering, you must offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know he was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name, that when your words come to pass, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? <laughs> hint, hint. So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it upon the rock to the Lord, and he did a wondrous thing while Manoah and his wife looked on. It happened as the flame went up toward heaven from the altar. The angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. Now, how's that for arising? When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. When the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and his wife, then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. And I want to remind you, in Genesis 22, 5, Abraham, first of all, in Genesis 22, was told to go sacrifice Isaac, his only son. Go to Mount Moriah, the place where I'll show you. And in Genesis 22, 5, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. And we will come back to you. What was the worship he was talking about? Offering up his son. And so worshiping and bringing the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to the Lord causes him to arise. Amen. Because we are exalting him. We're humbling ourselves and lifting him up. And Jesus said, if I be lifted up. Right? I will draw all men unto myself. And which one of us has a ministry that doesn't want to draw people to Jesus? Whatever your ministry is, it is to draw people to Jesus. Amen. So lift him up. Amen. Lift him up. Yes. I have been to places at times where I've been invited to come, even to lead worship, and, and uh, I'm looking around, and I said, well, where's... Where's the pastor? Oh, he doesn't really care for worship. He'll, he'll come in when the music stops. Wow. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I have people even at my church that come in 45 minutes late. Oh, he sings too much. But I just remind myself I'm not singing to them. I'm singing to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. Go with me to Second Chronicles chapter 20. And this was mentioned, uh, this whole episode with Jehoshaphat. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 13. Now, I want to I make a point here, so bear with me as I read these scriptures. Now, all Judah with their little ones, their wives and their children stood before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. Now, let me explain something to you. The Levites were in charge of praise and worship, and Asaph was a preeminent teacher of worship. He had a school of worship where the Levites learned to worship the Lord. So when it says that, that um, 
Jehaziel is a Levite of the sons of Asaph. He's trained in worship. Verse 15, and he said, listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. So worship, for one thing, to, uh, to notice here, uh, worship releases the prophetic move of God. Because Je- Jehaziel is, is prophesying here. Let me read to you, just, just stay there, but let me read to you out of Exodus 14.10 and show you the situation Moses was in at the edge of the Red Sea. You remember that one? And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, and this is very encouraging, all you pastors will understand this. Because there were no graves in Egypt, you have taken us away to die in the wilderness. Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? Oh my gosh. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Is Moses having a bad day? And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall not see again anymore forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. By the way, how is that for scattering your enemies? See, Jehaziel is speaking the word of God to reveal the will of God in their time of need. This is prophecy. This is why you and I need to study the word of God thoroughly. The more of his word that we know, the more we can apply it and speak it into situations that we or others are encountering. You can speak or reveal God's will in a situation if you know his character and how he responds to situations like the one you're in. Verse 18, and Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korahites stood up, oh, they have arisen, to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures forever. Now, when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. So you see the power of worship there. And it goes on to say that they just went down, as as Pastor David was sharing, they went down and just got, uh, for three days, were picking up the spoils off of those bodies because the Lord blessed them. And they returned to Jerusalem worshiping the Lord. Oh, that Pastor Stephen Gonzalez. He would think worship is the answer because he likes to worship. And Pastor Charlie, he thinks the answer is to write a book. (laughs) Pastor Manuel Perez thinks the answer is laying on hands and healing them. Pastor Ron Hemphill hmm. Thinks the answer is singing country songs. Listen, no one man has the answer. But the answer to all of our ills is for every Christian 
to arise and answer the call that God has placed on his or her life. You know, I, we were, I, I sang you that beautiful song, Touch Through Me, by Dottie Rambo. There's a lonely soul somewhere who needs just one friend to care. You know, I don't have a lot of time. I don't have a lot of time to go spend with a lonely person. I got stuff to do. Pastor Charlie, you too? But you're not the friend that that lonely person needs to meet. Introduce them to Jesus. And watch them flourish. How many times do we limit God? And the Bible says in Israel lim- uh, sinned because they limited the Holy One of Israel. And how many times do we put limitations on God or even on ourselves or our service to God because of this and because of that? The answer is to answer the call that God has placed on your life because as you arise, he will arise. Amen? Amen? Roberta took us to Isaiah 60, and I want to read it to you. I want to read you seven verses because they're amazing. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. There's no doubt that there's darkness. But what do they see in you? More darkness? Or someone who's shining? Because the glory of the Lord has risen over you. We should be different. But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. Verse 3, the Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your son shall come from afar, and your daughter shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant, and your heart shall swell with joy, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. The multitude of camels shall cover your land. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring golden incense. That's worship. And they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together to you. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister to you. They shall ascend with acceptance on my altar. And I will glorify the house of my glory. That's a move of God. That's God arising and, and something new and amazing happens. So I love that his word says, arise, shine for your light has come. In Matthew 4.12, just listen to this. This is recorded there. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In John 9, 5, Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But in Matthew 5, 14, and you all know this, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And then Romans 13, verse 11, speaks to us, I believe, about these days. 
And do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Ephesians 5.3 But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. He's talking to the church about these things. And it's in the church. We struggle with these things. We hear stories. That's, that's media fodder right there. A fallen pastor. A fallen leader. You know, I, I, I sang about the river that flows. And it says that when, when a godly man falls uh, before, the, before the wicked, before the world, he becomes like a murky spring or a polluted well. And imagine that flowing out of you and saying, you want to know Jesus? <laughs> you know, that's, that smells really bad. And if, if there are things in our lives, you'll, you'll have no desire to flow at all. And if you stay stopped up, you get stagnant. And, and it, it, it's just, it's, it's a trap. That's where the enemy wants us. So we have to repent of these things. We have to start to understand this cannot be allowed in my life. And I'm talking to myself here. So it says, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, never, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them, for you were once darkness." Oh my gosh, you know that? Yes, he knows that. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Verse 15 says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wide. Circumspectly. It means walk like you're walking in a cow pasture. Ooh. 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 Pay close attention where you're walking when you're walking through a cow pasture. Yes? And walk circumspectly when you're walking through this world. Because there's snares, there's traps, there's just vile things that you can fall into if you're not careful. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. What? Oh, that 
Pastor Steve, all he talks about is singing to the Lord. That's what the Lord is talking about here. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. That's a lot that we're supposed to be doing. And we can't do it in our own strength. But we have been given Pentecost. We have been given the power of the Holy Spirit. We have the power to make the right choice. Why don't we? Why don't we? Because we all make wrong choices. But we have the power to make the right choice. I had a very dear pastor friend who, who started this Bible study in his church. And it was for men uh, in his church with an emphasis on being accountable to each other. And it was attended by a wide range of people. There were some teens, and the oldest was a 92-year-old gentleman named Ed. Sharp as a tack, Ed was. One day, one of the brothers came in, about a 30-year-old brother, and he he starts to cry. And uh, he says, Pastor, at what age do these lustful thoughts and lustful desires and, and Ed said, it's not 92. <laughs> and it's true. Um, but he wasn't discouraged because they prayed together. And he had confessed his, his sin. He had confessed his struggles. And they came around him. They prayed for him. And like I said, he was accountable to them. Amen. And he made it through that season. But that season will come again. Right. And we've got to be careful. We've got to walk circumspectly. Amen? Yeah. But the truth is that no amount of human effort, human endeavor will accomplish in our lives what God requires of us as his sons and daughters. Only the power of the Holy Spirit can change a life. Only the power of the Holy Spirit can change a heart. But we have been given the Holy Spirit. We have him. You don't need to wait on anything else. You just need to use what you've already been given because nothing else is coming. You don't be waiting on the Lord for something besides the Holy Spirit. He's given us all that we need. But God does expect us to use it. Now, what hope is there for any of us if we don't allow the Lord to do his work in us? All of us know and greatly esteem Pastor Charlie Avila. His anointed ministry of pastoring, and he's a prolific writer of books. And we love him. Pastor Charlie, what if every member of your church read your books, memorized your books, quoted your books, but didn't do the things written in your books? They would be what we call book smart. But they have no no experience. I fear there are many Christians who are book smart. They can quote the scriptures. They can tell you all sorts of things about the Bible. But they don't apply the things they have learned. Paul spoke to this in Hebrews 5. Listen, this is Hebrews 5.12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, those who are mature, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. 
We're talking about being in a war right now, and we are. We definitely are. And and 2 Corinthians uh, 10, 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. We all know this, right? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience. And then there are these five words, when your obedience is fulfilled. Wait, but I have weapons that are not carnal to fight the enemy. But if you're not obeying the word, you've got a gun with no bullets. And, and, and it may look good, and you have it. It's been provided you. But it's your obedience that turns on the weapons, that energizes the weapons. Amen. Our obedience powers up the weapons of our warfare. A pastor friend of mine came to our church one time, and... Uh, I love this pastor. He reminds me of Pastor Charlie. I would love for the two of you to meet one day, Pastor Charlie. And um, he came to our church, and he was sharing that um, some Christians... uh, uh, Today, uh, Charlie and I were talking, and we were talking about Alan in 40 years, and I told him, we're starting to throw around some big numbers, Pastor Charlie. We're getting old, right? I've been serving the Lord for 42 years, and... uh, my pastor friend said, there are Christians who'll tell you they're, they're, they're 30 years old in the Lord, but they're really one year old 30 times because they never, never get past Jesus loves me or he forgives my sins or he died on the cross, was buried and rose again. Those are good things to know. But nothing, there's no application of this powerful word in their lives. And so there's no change. They stay in the same place. Have you ever run into that, pastors? Where somebody just stays in the same place year after year after year. And the chair they're sitting in may be molded. But they remain unmolded by the word of God. I am going to finish with something today. How many of you remember during the Obama administration, the day that gay marriage was legalized? And the White House was bathed in rainbow-colored lights. Be honest with me today. How many of you were angered, dismayed, or distressed by this? Raise your hands. I want to see your hands. I cried. I felt ashamed. I felt angry. I felt grieved. And then the Lord spoke something to me. He said, why are you conceding my promise to them? I want to say that again. Why are you conceding my promise of the rainbow to them? What is the significance of the rainbow? What did God say? What covenant did he make that he would never destroy it? Again, by flood, right? Now listen. What if God allowed the White House to be bathed in rainbow-colored lights to say, 
I will be merciful. I will remember my covenant and I will not destroy this nation because there's a remnant that loves me and serves me. How many of us that day, and be honest with me, lost sight of the covenant recorded in Genesis when you saw the White House lit up with pride colors? It was horrible. But it didn't knock the Lord off his throne. And furthermore, we're called to love those people. We're called not to lose our compassion for those who are so lost. I know gay people. I know transgender people. And I love them. But there comes a moment and they understand where we're not going to agree. But that doesn't preclude me from showing them the love of Jesus. And they'll receive the love of Jesus from me. And in a sense, you reap what you sow. And they, they don't agree with you, but they respect you. They don't agree with it, but they'll listen And they'll want to know why you don't agree. And they can accept it. But we must never lose our compassion for the lost. What if Jesus had lost his compassion for the lost? For the multitudes? We would not be here. That would have been it. And he had plenty of chances to lose it. Peter, put the sword away. Don't you know that I can call 10,000 angels and my father will send them? He went all the way. Are we going to go all the way? Are we going to serve the Lord with everything we have? Or are we going to just play church for the rest of our lives and tell people how many years we've been playing church and try to impress them? Our God deserves more, especially from his people. And I'm always reminded that Jesus came to his own. And his own what? They didn't receive him. Let's not be those people. Let his enemies be scattered. And let the righteous be glad. Yes, let the